Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again. I am Trace, and I am here with my friend Dr. Ali Matu from Columbia University Medical Center. Hi Trace, good to be here. Thank you for coming. So if you haven't listened to our other episodes, make sure you go back and check those out. You can see all four of those. They're all in the description. It's about how fear comes about, how it affects your body, why we like it so much. But now we're going to talk a little bit about how we can get over it, how we can fix it, how we can cure it, right? Mm-hmm. So this is complicated, but this is like yeah. your area of study. This is what I do. I'm a anxiety disorder specialist in New York City, so fear is my life. Oh, <laughs> sounds about right. So fear is sometimes good, it's sometimes bad, it's sometimes kind of fun, um, but what is it that turns fear into kind of a need to seek medical professionals or so, psychological? Yeah, that's a good question. And just like you were talking about in um, some of the earlier episodes, fear is a natural part of life. We want to experience it. It's something that keeps us safe. The problem becomes when it is so distressing that it's hard for you to get through a normal everyday situation, or if it gets to the point where it starts limiting your life, something we call impairment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could have a shark phobia, but you're living in Kansas, probably isn't affecting you too much. But if you're living in an environment where that starts to play out day to day, causing a lot of problems, getting in the way of your life, that's when the time you probably come in to seek help for it. So it's like a context thing. So if I'm yeah. like, you, you mentioned Kansas. So if I live in Kansas and I, I work there, I'm not going to, and I have a shark phobia, not a big deal. But yeah. if I'm like, make my living as a surf instructor, yeah. that could really impair my lifestyle and, and my well-being. So then I would want to come and talk to somebody who could help me with that. Exactly. What I see a lot of the time is someone might be struggling with something for many years, but now because of the context of their life and the situation they're in, now it's a problem. Now they need some help for it. Okay. So it, it's not so much that I am afraid of this and therefore should seek help. It's yeah. I am afraid of this and it's affecting me in this way. Exactly. And that's hmm. usually what gets people motivated to do some of the treatment that we're going to talk about in a moment, which is actually kind of hard treatment to do. There are different fears. There are different phobias. There, But what's like the difference between a fear and a phobia, I guess? Fear is completely normal. Got it. You see a snake. You see... Um, you see anything my that my ex-girlfriend on you the see street. your ex-girlfriend yeah totally i'm uh, scared now I'm you're going to be you're supposed to be afraid in those situations that's a survival mechanism you talked about a little bit earlier now what makes it a phobia what makes it a disorder is what we talked about before it's getting in the way of your life it's limiting what you can do okay okay so what kind of like phobias or fears and things do you normally work with discuss, discuss all that. sorts of things you could have a uh, you can have develop an anxiety disorder problem related to so many things so panic disorder is one of them panic disorder is sort of the fear of fear mm. it's the fear of all of those symptoms the heavy breathing feeling like you you can't catch your breath like you're the sweating the heat all of that kind of stuff all those physical symptoms of fear. You can have social anxiety. This is one that uh, people don't realize the degree to which it can get in the way of your life. Think about all the times today when you've had to interact with someone. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if that situation was so difficult for you and it produced so much anxiety, you might start avoiding those situations. Right. I'd rather stay at home. Exactly. It's too much work to get over that fear in order to interact with other people. Totally. And that's exactly what happens with these anxiety disorders is it starts to limit what you can do in your life. And you see the range of things that people can do get smaller and smaller. Then you have obsessive compulsive disorder where you might get preoccupied with certain thoughts or certain images and then feel like you have to do something over and over again until it feels right. And OCD can take on so many different ways. It it can be about the classical fear of contamination and feeling Mm -hmm. like you have to clean things like washing your hands yep. and things like that but it could also be really random stuff like things like you know related to electronics i worked with someone who had a fear that their phone was on and it might have caught them here saying something bad mm. and so they would constantly check the phone it can take on so many different areas wow um, you can also develop separation anxiety disorder where it's hard to be away from your parents and from your loved ones mm. um, you can have a fear of heights, a fear of clowns, as you mentioned, sure, fear sure. of blood injections, the Oof. list goes on yeah. and on. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like there's just so many different things that one can be afraid of. So how can you work with all of these different fears? And why is it that some people develop phobias from some of these things, like clowns as an example, and, and other people don't? You know, I'm not really 
like clowns are creepy, I guess, but I'm not like afraid of them. I don't mm. avoid them. If I see one, I'm not like, uh, I don't have like a reaction to that. So why is it that some people do? Some people just have a more of a predisposition to experiencing anxiety and fear. And so the whole process that you've been talking about this week, those emotional experiences play out in a much stronger way for these people. So you're mm-hmm. going through life kind of with the volume turned up oh. on fear. And sometimes you combine that with certain situations, and maybe something went poorly for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe you saw Jaws a little bit too young, Mm -hmm. or maybe you went through a social situation where you felt like you were being really judged or evaluated, and you felt really stupid or weird or strange. So what tends to happen there is these these things get paired up with one another. Mm -hmm. This situation is now associated with fear, and most people cope by avoiding that situation. So we never end up getting a chance to learn new information because we're avoiding these situations. So it sounds like classical conditioning. You know, exactly. Very similar to Ivan Pavlov and the dogs where you would ring the bell and they yeah. would salivate, except for instead of something more innocent like a food reward, this is a fear response. So instead of encouraging it, you're actually discouraging it. Exactly, and it also plays in with Skinner's work. Mm-hmm. And, and it it feel it's reinforcing to avoid these situations. Sure. It actually makes you feel better to avoid them. Yeah. So naturally, you're going to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's super cool. So it's almost like, to use terms from earlier, some people just have the low road kind of on auto. Like yeah. they are going to hit that low road much quicker. Yeah, for some people, the low road is like, ah, scary fear. And then for others, it's like, fear, get out of here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds awful. It's scary. That's my fear voice. Do people, uh, well, it's good to have one, I guess. Um, Do people who have more fear also tend to have larger amygdalas? It's possible, yeah. I mean, this is one of those interesting things where the early research looked at Vietnam War veterans. And them coming back from this war, a lot of them actually, who went on to develop PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, they actually had larger amygdalas. Now, we don't know if they went into war with a larger amygdala Mm -hmm. and experienced trauma in in a more significant way, or they experience more trauma and develop the larger amygdala. But what we do know, the brain is plastic. It responds to environments, and some people just have a different brain than someone else, and they might be wired to experience anxiety differently. Wow, that's so neat. So I have a, more of a personal story, Let's personal hear it. question. Yeah. So I uh, used to date a gal who was afraid of butterflies. Uh, so this kind of brings us to why some people have phobias and some people don't, you know? Yeah. This It seemed like kind of an irrational thing to be afraid of for me. But for her, she could peg it to one very specific event. And that was when she was growing up. She fell asleep with the window open and the light on. And a number of moths settled onto her bed. So when she woke up in the middle of the night and she was very young and moved, the moths just swarmed. Oh, man. She didn't know what to do. And she freaked out. And to this day, she cannot you know, see a moth or a butterfly without kind of having a very visceral fear response. Yeah. So that sounds very much like she paired this fear with, you know, kind of ongoing, an ongoing struggle that she might have. Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. And I'm guessing that she's avoided these things ever since. Absolutely. And even the slight appearance of them moving. Yeah. Probably it's all bring- about it's all about the flutter. So yeah. like in the movie Lord of the Rings, when Gandalf has the little moth that he talks to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she cannot watch that part of the movie. Yeah. She never has seen it. So she knows she has this fear. It's never really affected her life, so it's not a disorder necessarily. It's not a phobia. You can easily avoid moths. You right. don't encounter them all the time. Exactly. So she just doesn't go to butterfly houses. Yeah. She's fine. It's, it's all good. good. Yeah. But, but let's say she wanted to you know, handle this. She wanted to kind of get over this fear. What would she have to do? Well, here's a cool thing is we can actually hack Fear. We can treat this. I can treat this. You can treat this. And here's how we do it. So there's this cool thing that happens when you jump in a swimming pool, Mm -hmm. right? You jump in. What's it feel like at first? It's cold. Water is cold and uncomfortable. What do you do? I... I suffer with it. I just sit <laughs> you there. You suffer with... Well, yeah, you But it do. gets better. It gets better. It doesn't... Yeah. It's not always that cold. It, I... I guess I get used to it. You get used to it. It's not like the water warms up at all. I mean, not all the time. Sometimes, no, sometimes it does. But Maybe the sun comes out. And sure, sun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But your body gets used to it. That's this process called habituation. Basically, 
our human bodies are built to get used to things that remain the same. This is how we've been able to adapt to so many different climates around the world and why we can live everywhere. We can habituate, we can get used to things, and this is what we use to treat fear. So if your ex-girlfriend was coming into my office, what we would do is get an idea of all the different types of situations she's avoiding, mm -hmm. and then what we would do is something called graduated exposure. Exposing her to the exact type of thing that's creating the fear. But we do it in a gentle way. Okay. We start small. We we'll probably start with a cartoon picture of a moth. Uh huh. Not and, moving like a no. Nope. Like just still and be like, oh, this yep. is okay. This is like fine. a drawing. And then yeah. do you like slowly? Slowly start moving towards the thing that she's afraid of. So maybe we turn that into an animated GIF. Mm hmm. And then maybe we morph that into a movie. Mm -hmm. Maybe then we move to real life moths, but being very far away. And then each time sitting with the situation until the fear goes up, sitting with it, and then waiting for it to come down on its own for habituation to kick in. It always kicks in. Mm. And this is where some of the new learning comes into play. This is the Pavlovian stuff kind of getting unlearned. Got it. And this is where new thoughts and ideas emerge that, oh, well, the moths don't actually come towards me. Most of the time, they're actually trying to get away from me. So okay. both those things come into play. We're uncoupling the anxiety that's been associated and helping people to develop a new, more realistic way of approaching these things. And this happens, of course, in a safe space, similar to what we were talking about earlier, where you can only really do this if the patient feels comfortable. And also, yeah. they likely would have to have their own kind of Willpower. They actually want Absolutely. it. You can't forcibly exposure therapy. No, no, you can't. And the classic mistake a lot of people do is say, oh, okay, I got it, I got it. And they jump to the most feared thing. Ooh, no, no, no. And they try to do it once, and they're like, no, I got afraid. It didn't work. The point of this is to do it gradually and to experience fear. Hmm. There's nothing I can do to eliminate fear from your life. I wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. You know, we you, talked about we that. We talked be about bad. that. You It'll need be bad. fear. It's good you for you. You need to survive. You need to experience it, and I'm here to say that we are built to experience fear. Mm -hmm. We can endure it. Yeah, so I guess that brings me to this question. What if you, Ollie, are afraid of heights, yeah. per se, and yeah. you have somebody who comes in and they're like, I'm afraid of heights, Can let's work on this. Yeah. And you're afraid of heights. How? How does that work? This has actually kind of happened to me. Okay. One what, okay. what of the things about being an anxiety disorder therapist is I'm constantly working on my own anxiety. Got it. I Because I have to do these exposures with people. We do something called modeling, which is demonstrating how to approach these things. So okay. I have to approach it myself. I never had a fear of heights, but I did have a fear of sharks. Thank you, Jaws, for that. I don't know why my brother let me watch that when I was so young. Um, uh, it's had... I have a fear of bees. Mm -hmm, I've mm -hmm. never had to face it yet. I've tried. Bees are great. Yeah. They are really good. You I know, I, I just, I, the catastrophic thought that enters my head is I'm going to get stung mm -hmm. and like my Sting arm's going to explode. It's yeah. going to, like, yeah. I, I'm going to die. Swell up You're and die. die. Even though an allergist has told me I'm not allergic. That um, doesn't matter. But here's, I'm going to share a weird story with you. Can okay. I do a weird I'm ready. Story? I'm ready. All right. Test 2 Plus, we're all, all right. about it. This is an exclusive here. We were talking about Test penis shrinking earlier. So penis shrinking. This well, is this, is, this is this is very much applies. Oh, God. All right. So when I was in high school, there was this exchange student, and for some reason, he started peeing on me in the bathroom. Uh -huh. Like, I went to go use a urinal, and then he started peeing on me. It was very scary. I ran out of, of, the, Sounds of the bathroom. Sounds like a bad experience. It was sure. not good. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and so what ended up happening is I tried going into the bathroom. The next time, my heart started racing. Oh. I started sweating. And one of the things that happens when you experience fear, it kind of constricts muscles. Uh -huh. it, you know, fight so or you, flight. So you couldn't... In use the bathroom in the way that you used to use the bathroom. That is a correct and accurate statement. So what I started wow. doing is avoiding urinals. Oh. Now this worked through high school, through college, and then eventually I started to become a psychologist and I had a patient who was experiencing obsessive compulsive disorder about contamination mm -hmm. and had a fear of urinals. So you both had a fear of urinals but from different 
angles. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so what I ended up doing was I had to do my own exposure work ahead of his exposure work so we could get ready to the point where we were both facing that situation. Wow. So that's pretty, I mean, that sounds like kind of difficult for both you and your patient, yeah. but what about something like, you know, there's like new technologies, uh, mm -hmm. like virtual reality. Yeah. Could you do that with exposure therapy? Because it seems like you could make the perfect incremental raising of that bar yeah. in a virtual environment. You wouldn't have to go find, you know, the right bathroom or the right moth picture or something. You could just <laughs> go into VR and be it. like, this is it. This is what we have. And yeah. here's, the, here's the moth program, like the holodeck. You know, let's yeah. run through yeah, this. Yeah. Well, what's cool about VR is it's, it's going to allow us to do things that are sort of difficult for us to do right now. Like treating a fear of flying mm. is really hard in right. the modern world. I can't just go near a plane and through the security without a ticket anymore. So it's yeah. a little bit more costly to do that type of treatment. VR would really fast track that oh, and cool. help yeah. us to kind of pinpoint. The technology has to create a scene that's real enough that it's eliciting a lot of those physical symptoms of anxiety. Um, but the problem gets to something you talked about earlier, which is if you see a scary movie, part of the appeal is knowing that you're in a safe place. Mm. One of those things also comes up with VR is yeah. if you're feeling like it's not real, like you can't really get into it, it's not really gonna work. Um, sometimes w what we find though is it's, it doesn't take that much to create that fear and to do that exposure work. Um, with VR, we can do it. Sometimes we do a very low-tech solution, which is something called imaginal exposure, mm. which is just you sitting there, okay. closing your eyes, and imagining that spider that you're afraid of crawling up your leg. Oh, I don't like that. Like oh. zero to 10, you feeling anything I right now? I just felt like a little like weird-ass, like, tingly feeling. I was like, this isn't good. There's a See, spider on me. It, it really doesn't take worked, that much. Like right away. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. that's no, that's not, I'm not faking. That's now, weird. Now if we that did that weird. a second time, you wouldn't feel as right. powerfully as third. And I would then be like, oh, going. I got it. He's yeah. going to tell me there's a spider. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's no spider. I know yeah. there's no spider. So. so sometimes we might do imaginal stuff. Um, sometimes we might do something like VR. But what I often find is it doesn't take too much to elicit the type of things that people might be afraid of. So, just to round it out, make sure that, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about fear and whether it's good for you or bad for you. It seems like it's both good. It can be bad if it interferes with your whole life. And we're built to... We're built to face it. We're built to experience it. We're built to be able to write it out. Just yeah. something I tell people all the time is every emotion that you experience, it's like a wave in the ocean. It doesn't exist, and then sometimes it starts to crescendo, and it peaks but it's always going to crash onto the shore. It's never going to be there forever. Got it. Oh, that's a good way to look at it. So just for fun to kind of round this out, what's like the most memorable disorders or things that you've worked on when it comes to fear? One that really just comes to my mind right away is um, treating this uh, phobia of pasta. That's pasta phobia. Amazing. Um, also worked with a surgeon who had a fear of... Um, having shaky hands, which would be a problem. Yeah, if yeah. You're a Did surgeon. he or she have shaky hands? Well, that's the thing is what we think and what we experience is often not necessarily reality. Oh. And so a part of this was us eliciting those things and making his hands extra shaky. Um, we had him oh. hold a series of books to get his hands really worn out and then doing a practice surgery with um, some chicken. Mm -hmm. And I got some of my other friends involved, my other psychology friends, and they were sort of whispering, I believe his hand is shaking. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So it ends up actually being really creative. But it's, I think it seems like kind of like psychological theater where <laughs> we're creating this experience so that yeah. we don't have to do it in real life. We're practicing. Yeah. But at the same time, just the practice is enough to elicit that emotional response and totally. therefore kind of get used to it, habituate to it. Exactly. You That's got it. That's so awesome. That's yeah. so great. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Us. Yeah, and you have to come back. Oh, if, love to. If you guys have any ideas of how we can bring Dr. Ali Matu back, you let us know down in the comments. And make sure you subscribe so you get all of our Test 2 Plus episodes. If you haven't watched all of the episodes in our Fear series, please make sure you do that. They are amazing. Also, you can come find all of these on iTunes as one episode. We do this every week. If you aren't aware, go subscribe over there as well. And also, you can come find me on Twitter. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. Where can they find you? At Ali Matu. 
Great. Easy. On Twitter. Yeah. Great. Thanks for coming in. See ya. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. See you next time. <laughs>